Okay, so I'll kick it off now. It's one minute past 10. Um, so um, thank you very much for attending today's webinar. Um, today's webinar is directed towards owner managed businesses or family owned businesses um, even. Um, it's the first of our owner managed businesses for the Longford and Galway uh, regions. Um, and even any clients that are based in the Midland regions. We're planning on running four of these. Um, the first one today will be um, mainly around the COVID and the pandemic unemployment payments, um, certain issues around Irish and international tax considerations when looking at employees. Um, then we'll move on to share schemes and incentivizing um, employees. So you can see there's a little bit of a theme running through it. The last topic then obviously is just something that we've all born with for the last year and probably will be for many more years to come, but Brexit and um, the VAT and customs implications. So we have uh, five speakers today. Kicking off the session will be Alexandra O'Sullivan. She's a manager in our outsourced payroll department and she's based in Longford and she will be talking about wage support schemes. Secondly, will be Joanne Sinnott, who will be talking about remote working, which, as you can all know, is very apt in today's environment. She will be looking mainly at the Irish and some international tax considerations that we might not have thought about, but are very relevant. Joanne is an associate tax director in our employer solutions and is based in our Dublin office. I will then be talking about share schemes, so looking at ways to incentivize employees other than bonuses or a, a, a pay packet. Um, and I'm responsible for the Galway and Longford clients. I've recently taken over from John Lines, um, who a lot of you will know quite well. Um, but he's always on hand and he'll always be there to assist me or to answer any queries that any you might have, just in case people start wondering. Finally, then it'll be um, Lorcan O'Rourke, who's an associate director in our Galway, uh, who's based in our Galway tax practice, and Lee Squires, who's a director in our Belfast uh, practice. And they'll be talking about VAT and customs implications. So as you can see, we have a full action pack schedule um, and um, we'll proceed. I suppose just two or three housekeeping things. Uh, one, this session has been recorded, so it will be available on our website afterwards. Two, we will make the slides available to everyone who's attending this uh, conference. So don't worry if we're going too fast or we're, we'll be glossing over certain issues. And then finally, if you do have uh, any questions and answers, could you put them in the question and answer button and we will endeavor to answer them all at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, I will pass you over to Alexandra. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Alexandra O'Sullivan and I'm a manager on our outsourced payroll team. So today I'm going to be going through the wage support schemes that have been available to employers throughout the pandemic. So we'll move on to, the, thank you. So the first scheme that was in place was the temporary wage subsidy scheme or the TWSS. So this scheme was in operation from the 26th of March 2020 to the 31st of August 2020. And it was then replaced by the EWSS or the Employment Wage Subsidy Scheme. So you can see there over 66,000 employers availed of the TWSS. So quite a valuable scheme to employers last year. So moving on there, um, we're now at the TWSS reconciliation phase. So this reconciliation um, is applicable with respect to the transitional phase of the TWSS. So a reminder on that phase, this was operated from the 26th of March to the 3rd of May, 2020. And during this phase, employers calculated the average revenue net weekly pay for employees and then paid the relevant subsidy to the employees via the payroll. Revenue then proceeded to refund a max subsidy of 410 euro per employee per week to employers, regardless of the subsidy that was paid to the employee via the payroll. So now that excess subsidy that was paid by revenue is being reclaimed via this reconciliation process. And employers would have been um, advised at the time to hold on to this excess subsidy. 
So moving on then, um, stage one of the reconciliation process came into effect um, last October. So revenue would have asked employers to report the actual TWSS amounts that were paid to employees. So if you, if you haven't already um, completed this stage, then you should do so now. Um, revenue are reaching out to employers that haven't completed this stage. And just to be aware that failure to provide this information may result in revenue recouping the TWSS that was paid to employers. So most employers at this stage should have received a reconciliation statement through Ross. Once you've received this statement, you have the option to accept the reconciliation if you're happy with the figures. Um, you can make corrections to any pay slips if necessary. And then if you have any queries or you feel that the figures are incorrect, you can make an inquiry through my inquiries on Ross. So once the employer has accepted this statement, a statement of account will be sent to their Ross inbox. And this will require the employer then to pay any additional amount owed to revenue. So the next slide then, um, another area of interest um, around the TWSS is the tax liabilities that have arisen for employees that were on the scheme. So what, when the scheme was in operation, employers were not required to deduct PAYE and USC from the subsidy through the payroll. So revenue are now seeking this PAYE and USC directly from the employees. Most employees will have received a preliminary year end statement through their revenue my account and most employees that were on this scheme will more than likely have a tax liability. So there are a number of options there with how they can pay this tax liability to revenue. So the first option being an adjustment to the employees tax credits and rate bands over a four year period and this will commence in January 2022. The second option there is the employee may pay the full amount due to revenue in one payment, or they may make a partial payment and then the balance will be satisfied by an adjustment in their tax credits. And then the third option there is the employer may pay these tax liabilities on behalf of the employee. So just moving on there. Revenue have announced that there will be a BIK concession for employers who wish to pay the tax liabilities that arose as a result of the TWSS. So therefore, employers who choose to pay this liability for the employees, no additional tax charge or BIK will arise. So initially, the deadline for this, for employers to make this payment was the 30th of June 2021. Revenue have recently extended that to the 30th of September of this year. So just on the next slide there, you'll see we have recently received an update from Revenue on this concession. So you'll see there the three main points that were highlighted in this update. The first point being for employees who are self-assessed taxpayers or who are jointly assessed with a self-assessed spouse, this concession will apply to them. Secondly there, where the employer pays a TWSS tax related liability for a proprietary director, the concession will be available for that director, but only if the employer pays the liability for all employees in the company. And then thirdly, where the tax liability is not fully settled, so where the employer makes a partial payment, the balance is then payable over a four year period by way of a tax credit adjustment commencing in January 22. And this would apply to employees who are PAYE, PAYE taxpayers. So we have a bulletin published on our website with this update and I've just popped a link on the bottom of that slide there if you'd like to read more on that. So moving on to the next slide then, um, we're going to discuss the employment wage subsidy scheme, which is the wage subsidy scheme that is in place at the moment. So firstly, how do you qualify for this scheme in 2021? So eligibility for the EWSS 
is based on a 30% decline in turnover or customer orders in the period 1 January 21 to 30 June 21, compared to the same period in 2019. So you would need projections and calculations, and you would need documents and evidence to support these projections. So if it's a case that turnover or customer orders aren't applicable to your business, you may apply an alternative reasonable basis when looking at your eligibility. If you are applying an alternative basis, then you should seek revenue guidance on this. And there are also special rules where your business didn't commence until after the 1st of January 2019. So I suppose another important thing to note before you register for the EWSS is to make sure you have tax clearance in place. So when you proceed to the registration process, if there is no tax clearance there, you won't be able to register. So then once you're happy that you've satisfied the conditions and you want to proceed with the claim for EWSS, you need to register for the scheme via ROS ahead of the payroll run for which you wish to make the claim. So we would recommend giving at least 48 hours for this registration to be completed before a claim can be made. So you would make the claim with your payroll submission. So generally this tends to be a box that you tick on your payroll software in respect of each employee that you're claiming subsidy for. And then when you submit this to revenue, they'll receive that information and refund the subsidy accordingly. So moving on to the next slide, I suppose important things for employers to note, um, you should retain evidence of appropriate documentation, including copies of projections to demonstrate continued eligibility over the specified period. And it's also important that you undertake a review on the last day of every month to ensure that you continue to meet the eligibility criteria. So while you're carrying out these reviews, um, if you feel that you no longer qualify, you must deregister from the scheme via ROS following the day of your review and cease claiming the subsidy via payroll. So you would untick that box on your payroll software before your next payroll submission. You can then re-register for the scheme if you do feel that you're eligible in the following pay period. So we'll just take a look at the next slide then. So these are the current EWSS subsidy rates that are in place. So you'll see there that any employee whose gross weekly pay is less than 15150 or is over 1,462 euro, no subsidy rate applies to these employees. So the employer won't receive a subsidy in respect of these employees. The other subsidy rates then vary from 203 euro per week to 350 euro per week. And this depends on the employee's gross pay. So moving on then, um, in, with regard to compliance checks for the EWSS, Revenue are currently undertaking risk-based real-time compliance checks by reaching out to employers. So at the moment, there is no assurance check program in place. Um, we would have seen the compliance check for TWSS last year. This hasn't been rolled out yet in terms of EWSS. Revenue will issue details on how this future assurance check program will operate prior to its commencement. So I suppose at the moment, in terms of these um, risk-based real-time compliance checks that are being carried out at the minute, what revenue are looking for is um, a summary of the impact of COVID-19 restrictions on the turnover of the business, a detailed explanation and supporting documentation concerning the monthly reviews you're undertaking, and also details of projected and actual turnover with any relevant relevant adjustments to support entry into the scheme. So finally there on the EWSS, if for any reason you need to pay back the subsidy, so whether revenue have requested that you pay back the subsidy or whether you feel that you actually weren't eligible in the first place, um, there are a few steps that you need to do in order to pay this back. So the first step would be look at the pay period in question. So 
we'll say, for example, if you submitted a payroll for April and, and you were um, claiming the EWSS and you now realize that you shouldn't have, you would need to go back into your payroll software, untick that marker for EWSS, resubmit your payroll to revenue on that basis. So when revenue receive this updated submission, they will then recalculate the employer's PRSI at the standard rate. So any employer who's currently on this scheme is getting a reduced rate of employer PRSI of 0.5%. So revenue will recalculate at the standard rate and then a statement will be issued outlining the amount of PRSI that the employer needs to pay back. So then in terms of the actual subsidy that was received, this needs to be repaid separately. So in order to repay that, you would need to go to the RevPay facility on Ross and you would select EWSS from the drop down menu there. And when you select that, then you can repay the amount of the subsidy. So just um, that's all on the EWSS really. I suppose this scheme is in operation until the 30th of June, um, but our understanding is this may be extended in some shape or form. Um, so there will be updates on that in the future. So I will now pass you over to Joanne Sinnott. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining. As Iona mentioned, my name is Joanne Sinnott, and I'm an Associate Director in the Tax Department in Grand Thornton, and I specialise in global mobility and employment taxes. So this morning, I'll be speaking to you about the Irish and international tax considerations of remote working. And as we're all aware by this stage, remote working is common practice and has been for over a year now. The traditional workplace has changed and employers need to be aware of any tax obligations that they may have when their staff are working remotely, especially if their remote working place happens to be in another jurisdiction. So there are a number of scenarios for Irish employers and employees when it comes to remote working. Uh, or working in another country, whether it's due to the COVID-19 pandemic or if it's just for normal business needs of the organisation. So during the pandemic, Irish employers may have facilitated some of their employees to work remotely in a foreign jurisdiction if it's their home country. And as I said, this may create Irish tax issues for both the employer and the employee that um, neither may have been aware of. So uh, my next slide just uh, goes through the tax risks. And the first one that I mentioned here is the permanent establishment risk. So where an Irish entity has employees performing their employment duties outside of Ireland, this may give rise to a corporate tax presence in the foreign jurisdiction and consequently a permanent establishment or PE. If a taxable presence is created in another jurisdiction, the Irish entity may have to comply with tax reporting obligations of that jurisdiction. Guidance from the OECD has told us that working from home because of the COVID-19 crisis should not create new PEs for the employer. And Irish Revenue have also issued similar guidance, which is helpful. However, um, the foreign tax position should also always be considered. Uh, there are also foreign payroll reporting obligations along with setup costs to consider. Um, so foreign and local payroll reporting obligations can arise for the Irish employer where their employees are carrying on duties of their employment outside of Ireland and employers may need to comply with payroll tax reporting obligations of that country and uh, depending on where the employee may be located as well as uh, payroll obligations in Ireland. Um, a dispensation may be available for the Irish empl employer uh, regarding the operation of foreign payroll. Um, however, again, it's important to obtain the foreign advice uh, in this regard. Payroll reporting requirements differ from country to country uh, and tracking of working time spent in these foreign jurisdictions will be critical in determining whether or not there is a requirement for the company. In certain cases, an Irish PAYE exclusion order may be applied for, which will allow the Irish employer to turn off any Irish PAYE in USC, providing certain conditions are met in respect of the employee. Um, social security is also uh, another consideration um, and typically social security provisions of the country where the employment duties are actually carried out uh, will apply. However, there are EU regulations and bilateral agreements that we can rely on to make it possible for the employee to remain in the Irish social security system and to avoid a foreign or a double social security charge. Um, careful consideration of the rules is required here and there may be a need for a retention certificates from the Irish authorities as well. 
So the tax resident status and potential unexpected higher personal tax obligations for the employee uh, will also be a risk. Uh, tax residency may be triggered where an employee spends time in another state, which may result in personal tax filing and reporting obligations. And, and income that was previously outside of the scope of that foreign jurisdiction may now be within the remit of taxes. Um, again, the tax residency rules are specific to each jurisdiction and there may be some force majeure concessions due to the pandemic. Um, again, also just to note, wherever there is an element of double taxation, uh, there may be a relief available under a double tax treaty if we have one in place with that country, depending on, on where the employee may be. So if we move on to my next slide then, um, Revenue introduced a number of concessions in March 2020, which uh, they were brought into support employers and employees dealing with kind of any employment and employment tax and global mobilities issues that were created by COVID-19. Uh, a lot of these did end on 31 December 2020. However, some of them have continued into 2021 and um, some of them will be expected to apply uh, for the duration of the pandemic. The measures that continue to apply on a concessionary basis for 2021 have been listed here in the slide and the first item on the list relates to the residence rules and enforcement or circumstances. So technically this concession did actually end on the 31st of December uh, last year. Um, however, a number of reference representations have been made by the inst institutes to request that the concession be reconsidered um, as into 2021, as I think we're all aware that the public health advice has consistently stated that travel any form of travel, especially foreign travel, increases the risk of contraction and spread of COVID-19. So in a nutshell, provided certain conditions were met, the concession stated that an individual would not be regarded as being present in the state for residency purposes due to the uh, due to extraordinary natural occurrences that couldn't have been foreseen or avoided. And in March 2020, revenue confirmed that where a departure from the state was prevented due to COVID-19, that they will consider, consider that this is force majeure uh, when they're considering the individual's uh, tax residence position. There are quite a few things to consider in order for the force majority conditions to apply in to have applied during 2020. And basically the individual must have left Ireland on or by the 1st of June 2020 or the force majority provisions won't apply to any of the days um, unless they can prove that the only reason why they stayed here was or couldn't leave was due to health issues. Um, also, the provisions of the concession do not apply to anybody who actually arrived into Ireland on or after the 6th of May 2020. Um, as, as I just mentioned there, Revenue have recently confirmed that the concession will not um, apply from 1 January 21. However, we are hoping for a response to our, the submissions that were made in due course. Um, the next concession then related to transport and workers relief and guidance uh, states that where employees are required to work from home in Ireland due to COVID, uh, such days spent working at home will not stop an individual from availing of this relief provided all the normal conditions of the relief are met and that the, this measure will continue to apply for tax year 21 as long as they're required to work from home due to COVID-19. There were also a number of conditions relating to benefit in kind, and it was confirmed that where COVID-19 testing is performed or arranged by an employer or where an employer provides a COVID-19 test kit for self-administration, no BIK charge will arise. Uh, again, a BIK normally arises where accommodation is made uh, available to an employee for private use. However, where temporary accommodation is provided by an employer in order to mitigate against any potential transmission risks, um, then no BIK charge will arise for the, for the period of the COVID-19 crisis. And finally, as I mentioned uh, before, Irish Revenue have confirmed that they will disregard for corporation tax purposes any presence in the state that is due to travel restrictions uh, related to COVID-19. Um, so my next slide then just, just talks about uh, the concessionary measures that did actually cease as of 31 December 2020. Uh, so Irish Revenue had confirmed that foreign employers didn't have to operate Irish payroll where employees relocated temporarily to Ireland during COVID-19. However, they did, it, it was noted that the individual may still have an Irish personal tax liability in their own capacity. And similarly, with respect to multi-state workers, a foreign employer could continue to operate Irish payroll based on the established work pattern pre-COVID, where the normal conditions were satisfied. Um, and both these measures uh, ceased on the 31st of December, 2020. Since 1 January 21, employers are required to operate PAY in the usual manner and obviously this is subject to any exceptions that are, are normally available under Irish law and uh, guidance. There were a number of extensions then given as well in respect to filing and reporting deadlines during 2020 which included 
the SARP applications, MEPA OIE dispensation applications, and also the share scheme reporting deadlines. Uh, no similar extensions were introduced for 2021, and the normal deadlines were uh, applied as of 1 January 2021. Um, where an employer was seen as integral to Sorry, where an employee was seen as in, is integral to the business and was required by the employer to return to Ireland to deal with any uh, COVID-19 related issues. And as long as the costs incurred were reasonable and the employee wasn't otherwise compensated, no VIK charge uh, arose from the period of March to December 2020. Again, this measure uh, ceased to apply for, as of 31 December 2020 and for 2021 uh, normal provisions apply in the usual manner in respect of any non-business uh, related travel. So my next slide then um, just uh, outlines, sorry, yeah, just moving on to the next slide there. A num um, so a number of other employment tax measures were available to assist employers and employees to deal with the impacts of COVID-19 and these include uh, tax relief for e-working and special rules for employees working from home due to COVID-19. Um, this includes a tax repayment from the employer of 320 per day or where that payment is not made, employees uh, can make a claim in respect of any light heat and broadband bills through their own year-end tax returns. There are also uh, benefit and kind exemptions for providing equipment to employees to set up a working space in their homes and also payment to taxi fares for transporting staff due to any health and safety concerns uh, for the duration of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and then there is a special concession that was made to the small benefit exemption of 500 euros per year for certain frontline and key employees. There have also been specific BIK rules for the provision of company cars for the duration of the pandemic as well. Um, so just on my next slide, um, it's there, there are a number of Irish tax implications to consider in respect of remote working abroad, a lot of which I have touched on in the previous slides, such as the, any potential dual payroll withholding obligations and the operation of a foreign payroll. The costs and logistics that come with this can often be um, can, they can be difficult to implement um, and is one that needs um, a lot of consideration. Social security and residency status of employees also have to be considered along with any potential force majeure measures relating to COVID-19 and any impact that, th that this may have on relief that the employees may already be entitled to. Local employment law requirements may also arise for the Irish employer and working visa requirements should also be considered and especially now with Brexit. So this convenient, conveniently brings me on to my next slide. Um, which is just uh, a short slide on the Brexit implications. So along with visa considerations for employers, there is also social security to think about. However, the Social Welfare Order 2020 came into effect as of 1 January 2021, and it ensures that the maintenance of social security rights and entitlements remain the same for Irish and UK citizens as, as before Brexit. Uh, which is very similar to EU regulations that ensure employees should only pay social security in one country. Um, it is important to note that Brexit hasn't changed the underlying tax rules in Ireland. However, because of our geographic location and close business relations, we would expect to see an increase in short-term business visits between Ireland and the UK. And this may have uh, tax implications for both the individuals and for the company. And we would encourage employers to carry out a review of their workforce to identify any individuals who may be impacted by any immigration restrictions as well. Um, so my last slide then is just uh, what's next. Um, there are plenty of considerations for employers as we continue to navigate the remote work and going forward. Many companies uh, may adopt a more hybrid approach in the future in order to try and facilitate their employees However, where employees are allowed to work outside of Ireland, um, there are a number of tax implications to consider. So for now, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for your time, and I'll pass you back to Una, who is going to be speaking about share schemes. Thank you. Thanks a million, Joanne. So I suppose um, we're looking at our employee base. We have retained them by either claiming some subsidies. Um, we're now going to pay the tax through the concessionary measures that Alex has talked about. We've been cognizant of our remote working and if employees are either up in, in the north or in the UK or even have gone home to their, their own respective home countries. And it might be time now to sit back and go, OK, so we've done an awful lot for our employees 
um, and we've managed to retain them through the, the difficult year that it was. Um, and now we're looking at ways that we could motivate them or incentivize them. And what I would always say to you, firstly, is if you're an owner managed business or a family business, I would be very wary of doing share schemes. Um, and instead, I would be looking at, OK, could we do bonuses? Could we give them certain benefit and kinds that they might be more mindful of? But if this isn't a factor or if this isn't something that you're interested in or your employees are driving that they want a bit of a share in the company, then I would be recommending a share scheme. However, really, 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 really important that I stress share schemes, you do need advice from the outset. Um, a lot of what we see that comes across our desks are share schemes that have gone wrong or share schemes that have been implemented with uh, as a result of the employer or the owner manager not really understanding what is happening. So I suppose if the first slide is anything to go by, what I'm going to say is that when you as the owner gives shares to the employees, you have a CGT liability. So it's not as simple as saying, oh, I'm going to give you some of my shares. Well, it is, but the tax implications can be quite high on that, this amount. The second thing that you always need to be mindful of is that where employees receive free shares, they are deemed to be receiving a benefit, which means that you have income tax implications from the outset, depending on the type of share that you're getting. If they don't pay the shares, or they get it at undervalue, then revenue say that you're deemed to have an interest-free loan on the amount that you don't pay for the shares. And this could be um, quite penal in that it's 13.5% per year, and it has to be done through your payroll. And because we have payaway homogenization now, it should be done every month. And therefore you could be running up quite high tax costs unbeknownst to yourself. The next really, really important thing that when you're looking at um, looking at a, a share plan and you're trying to decide, well, what plan suits my business? Um, you have to look at a, my, a few things. And that's what the next slide will show you is what type of share scheme do you want in place? What type of rights do you want to give uh, your employees? Um, what type of reward do you want to have um, your employees now? Do you want employees to have shares now? or at a future point in time. And that's the difference between um, a share being given now and a share option. Um, if you've got a group structure, where do you want the shares in the group structure? Do you want it at the holding company level? And you might have three or four different companies. And that means that the employee will share in all those three or four companies. Do you want it in the subsidiary that they work in that you want them to drive that business going forward? Um, so these are all things that you need to consider. Is tax efficiency part of it or is tax the last thing that you're thinking of and that you genuinely want to give them shares, you genuinely want them to share in the um, growth of your business? The next slide then will tell you about some of the tax considerations for employers. So we know that there's no employer PRSI, which is currently at 11.05%, so quite high. When we put in a share scheme, companies can get certain deductions for it. However, there is a mindful of um, reporting obligations that you now have to give to revenue, both on implementing the share scheme and if employers are in, sorry, if employees are filing tax returns, they will also have to show um, that they've received shares in the company. Really, really important thing is evaluation. So guys, I would never put in a share scheme without getting a current upmarket valuation. I think this is key to the whole um, um, implementation of a share scheme. And the reason why it is so important is that obviously it's an income tax event. Revenue are looking at it and they're going, well, have we gotten our take of this? Do we have any tax owed to us? And if we don't get the valuation correct, then there could be tax leakage and it could end up being hefty penalties, interest at a later point in time. Other things that we discuss with the employers and the employees is, do we want shares up front or is a share option scheme better? So again, a lot of things to be teased out, talked about before you put in any share scheme. So moving on to the next slide, please. Um, Again, valuation of company, and I've set that really important no matter what share scheme you put in. And I will talk through it as we move on through, through the, the slides. So, next slide, please. 
Again, when you're giving employee shares, this is just a generic thing that we put together here in Grand Thornton. Do you want the employees to have dividend rights? Do you want them to have voting rights? What happens if they're a bad lever? Are you going to put in bad lever, good lever provisions? Or is it that there's only one lever and that is if you die or if the company is sold? Um, is there going to be drag and tag rights? So these are rights that means that the minority shareholders are pulled along if you're going to sell a company or if, you've, if you're passing certain resolutions. What type of access are they going to have to your company's accounts and to your company information? Is this something that you want to give them? And you've got to remember, as a shareholder, you are automatically entitled to certain rights under the Companies Act. So again, being very mindful of that. Um, so there is, um, on the next slide, there is um, uh, certain share schemes that are in place for owner-managed businesses. These are slightly different to the Facebook and the Googles and every other PLC. And the reason why it is slightly different is you've got to remember the Facebook, the Google, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer even now, the, all the names that we've become so familiar with, they are trading on a stock market. They already have a market for buying and selling shares. So exit events are quite easy to determine for uh, PLCs. Not so easy when you're an owner-managed business. How, if an employee has shares and they're going to leave in six or seven years, how are you going to exit them? Who's going to buy the shares? We, who's, how are they going to leave with the shares? Do you want a, a disgruntled employee out there working for your competitor and owning shares in your business and would have certain rights? Again, all things that need to be considered before you put in a share scheme. These type of schemes are very easy where you're setting your business up for sale. If you know you're going to sell your business in five to 10 years time, putting in a share scheme for employees can be quite tax efficient. We know that there's an exit event because you're going to sell and we know that someone's going to buy their shares and there's only one lever provision being the, um, the sale or an IPO if you get lucky. Um, so as I said, for owner managed businesses, we really have about three or four share schemes that I'm going to go through at a very, very high level. I'm just conscious of time. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you a high level overview of these share schemes. And then you can have a look at the slides later rather than we go next slide, next slide, next slide. OK, so share options. Um, when you give share options, it is a requirement to it's sorry if you could go to the next slide please if you give share options um it's basically an option to purchase the shares in the future so you actually don't own the shares outright you just have an option to buy those in the future um if it's done within seven years there is no income tax sorry there's no tax implications at all on granting the option however when the employee exercises that option and what we mean by exercise is they go to actually buy the shares in the company then there is an income tax event and the employee will have to pay the income tax. So again, share options work very well in PLCs or large multinationals or even very, very large businesses because there's all there's a market there. So you can exercise your option, i.e. buy your shares and you pretty much sell then to pay the tax arising on the share options. Now you don't have to do that, but you do then have to be mindful of how is the employee going to fund the exercise of the share option. Now, if they have sufficient cash to either buy it outright or pay their tax, then this isn't an issue. But in more cases, um, they don't. Um, again, you do have to file it for more TSO1. And this is a case with an awful lot of share schemes. You have numerous reporting requirements to revenue that you have to do um, when you either grant option, share options, when you exercise the share options. So um, moving on to the next slide, I've given an overview of the how a share option would work. I'm not proposing to go into detail here, but again, if you have any questions on review of this, please come back to me. So next slide, please. Um, the KEEP scheme then has been a new scheme that was introduced, and this is very like a share option scheme. So basically, you're granted um, options to acquire shares in the future. However, major um, difference between a share option and a KEEP scheme um, is that there is no income tax when you go to exercise the share option. So it removes that barrier. And then there's only CGT when you when you sell it. And numerous conditions that need to be satisfied. And um, we haven't seen much of these keep options in practice. In fact, I think I was reading recently that there's only 57 such, such, such schemes in force in the country at the moment. And that just shows how quite how um, stringent the conditions are for both the employee 
and for the company. So if we move on to the next slide, again, I've given an overview of the difference between a keep option and an, a, a normal share option, i.e. non-keep option. Again, major differences is that there is no income tax on the exercise of the share option or the keep option, sorry, and there's only CGT when you go to dispose of it. So again, very brief overview, but it is a scheme that's there and it's one that's quite liked. Like when we talk about these to our clients, they love the idea of the keep scheme because it does give the best tax answer, but it's quite difficult to implement. The conditions are quite onerous. So if we go on to the next slide, we have a different um, kind of uh, share scheme. And this is a bit of a, a, I suppose, a fallacy in that it's not really a share scheme. So they're called phantom option schemes. And basically the employee's bonus or their employee's share of the profits are linked to the value of the shares. And if the value of the shares goes up, then they get a bonus or a payment out based on how the value of the shares going up as the case may be. Um, revenue approval is not required. It's basically an internal scheme that you do. And it's just a way of basically giving a value over to the employee, but without actually giving away a portion of your company that you've built up from scratch and that you have worked really hard on. And then you don't have to worry about if the employee leaves, they don't leave with anything. Um, they leave with the benefit of losing out on this phantom share option scheme. So again, it's another way of, of rewarding employees or incentivizing employees without actually giving away your company. So then the, the next share scheme that I want to talk about, which has become very popular in recent years, is the flowering share scheme or the growth share scheme. And basically what this means is that the share, the employee is given a share that has no historical value in your company. It's not entitled to share in any of the past history of the company, and it's only entitled to any future uplift. Um, so when the company is sold, um, let's say if the company was valued at four million when you were given the flower and share scheme to the employee and the company was sold for six million and they only got one percent of any uplift, they would get one percent of any uplift between the four million and the six million. So, again, very, very tax efficient in handing over shares to your employees without any tax implications up front. Um, and it also means that your employee has to grow the business, has to drive the business forward if they want to get any benefit out of it. So again, just moving quickly through the slides, um, please. Um, the, the next one that we've looked at is the approved profit sharing scheme. This is very common in um, multinationals or PLCs again, and it's a type of saving schemes in, in, for employees within your company. Um, the maximum amount that you can have is 12,700. Revenue approval is required. And again, shares are held in a trust format. So again, it is something that is there, um, but we have, to, we have to get revenue approval. The last share scheme that we do an awful lot of is the restricted share schemes. And this is basically where you get quite a good tax um, answer in that your valuation, again, is really important. You value the share and then you can actually abate that taxable value by 60 percent. And the employee is only subject to tax essentially on 40 percent of the value of the share. But again, it's an upfront tax cost for the employee. And what we find is that uh, employers uh, will generally fund that upfront tax cost by paying a bonus. But it can be quite expensive for the company. So um, just something to be very, very mindful of when you are looking at share schemes. So the very last slide I have is basically um, a, an overview of the income tax and the taxable events that arise when you issue shares. Um, and that's something that you should look at and be mindful of at all times when you are issuing shares to employees. So that's my whistle stop tour of share schemes. I appreciate there's quite a lot in of it. But if you get anything out of today's session is valuation is important and always talk to an advisor before putting in any share scheme and also be mindful of the type of share scheme that you're putting in. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Lorcan. Thank you. Thanks, Rina. Uh, next slide there, please. Um, yeah, keep going to slides, please. You go. So good morning, everyone. So as per Una's initial introduction, my name is Lorcan O'Rourke, and I'm an indirect uh, tax specialist with Grant Thornton. We're based in Guy, but servicing the BNW region. Next slide, please. 
So this morning, I will be giving a broad overview of the VAT and customs implications Brexit had, has had on cross-border supply of goods between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, and also Great Britain, which is the UK, uh, excluding Northern Ireland. And I'll be joined by my colleague, Lee Squires, who will take a closer look at the VAS and customs implication resulting from the imp implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol and also examine the, the Brexit implications from a UK perspective. Um, we'll then conclude with some action points for businesses in addressing Brexit issues and also highlight some financial supports uh, businesses may be eligible to avail of when seeking tax advice on Brexit related matters. So next slide, please. Um, in terms of the trade and cooperation agreement, um, I suppose firstly, by way of context, as of 1 January 2021, the UK left the EU single market and union, and as a result is no longer bene benefiting from the principle of the movement of goods. So as everyone is probably aware, um, Brexit, a Brexit deal was reached at the 11th hour between the EU and the UK. Um, however, even with the new agreement in place, businesses will face new trade barriers leading to increased costs and will require adjustments to integrate their EU and UK supply chains. So the provisions in the agreement do not cover the trade in goods between the EU and Northern Ireland, which is covered by the Northern Ireland Protocol. And, and just to point out on, on the Northern Ireland Protocol, its implementation now means that Northern Ireland will have the most complex VAT and customs regime in the whole of Europe. Um, the new trade and cooperate, cooperation agreement or TCA between the EU and UK, those provide for zero tariffs and zero quotas on all EU and UK origin goods from day one. So, that being said, it's important to stress here that it is only goods that have UK and EU origins that can avail of, of these preferential tariffs and quotas. And Lee will pick up on the whole concept of origin a little later in the, in the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So if we if we frame the, the Brexit trade deal or, or the TCA, um, you know, in the context against the, the EU single market, um, albeit the trade agreement is welcomed, inevitably trade between the EU and the UK will be very different compared to the frictionless trade we enjoyed in, in the EU's customs union and single markets. Um, the main difference being that, as, as previously mentioned, the, the rules of origins will apply in order to qualify for preferential uh, trade terms. Also, business, businesses importing um, and exporting will need to make import and export declarations as appropriate for each consignment of goods. And in addition to the import and export declarations, separate safety and security declarations may be needed uh, by the carrier of the goods. So the, the TCA does not remove the need for these requirements. Um, Businesses will also need to consider the commodity codes, um, classifications and valuations of their goods for tariff purposes. And, and also businesses, I suppose, will, will also need to consider um, if there's any way to mitigate these impacts through any special procedures such as custom warehousing, inward or outward processing or, or temporary admission. So overall, I suppose there's, there's no hiding the fact that Brexit has resulted in a more onerous process in moving goods, which is time consuming, consuming and carries a heavy administration, administrative burden on businesses. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the first scenario we look at is um, an Irish trader selling into Northern Ireland and this particular scenario is, is relatively straightforward as, as broadly the same fat treatment still applies post Brexit, Brexit as it did pre Brexit. So it's a case of as you are. Effectively, there's no hard border on the island of Ireland, uh, uh, and, and Northern Ireland must follow the rules of the EU single market for goods. So its standards remain harmonized with Ireland, and there is no need for regulatory checks and go on goods crossing the land border. However, one small change is that um, Northern Ireland businesses will now be issued with XI VAT numbers, as opposed to GB uh, numbers, which will be their EU VAT number that allows traders to, to be linked into the EU VAT system 
when filing their statistical returns, such as interest tax or, or visa or EC sales reporting. Um, this XI VAT number also should be used by Irish businesses when they're required to close a VAT number if they're selling um, into uh, Northern Ireland to Northern Ireland VAT registered customers. Uh, I suppose the main point to take from this though is that trade from a trader's perspective is that there is no requirement to file customs declarations um, to record the movement of goods between Ireland and Northern Ireland. Uh, next slide, please. So the next scenario we're looking at here is um, Irish clients uh, or Irish traders selling goods into Great Britain and, and vice versa, um, goods moving from Great Britain into Ireland. So um, trade with Great Britain has now become a third country trade, which means um, sales of goods from Ireland to Great Britain should be treated as exports. And, and generally exports are, are zero race for VAT purposes. Um, the same rules should apply on the sale of goods from Great Britain to Ireland, where um, the goods or the export should be zero rated on export. Um, an export declaration will be required, and Irish traders should ensure that they have an ERI number um, and are registered for customs and excise. So for those of you, I suppose, not aware of an ERI number, um, it's, it's a, any economic operator's registration identification number. And it's a common reference number for interactions with the customs authorities uh, in any member states. Um, also another point there on this particular scenario is that uh, import VAT uh, sh should arise on the importation of goods into Ireland from Great Britain. Um, the import VAT is usually paid at the point of importation. However, to mitigate against this cash flow impact of the upfront cost for businesses, um, Ireland has legislated for postponed VAS accounting for businesses that are registered for VAS and customs and excise in Ireland. So uh, postponed accounting uh, effectively enables traders to, to self account for VAS on their VAT return so that import VAS uh, subject to the rules of deductibility can be reclaimed at the same time as it's declared on the VAT return. So it's, it's relatively straightforward. It's a reverse charge transaction similar to the manner in which intercommunity EU transactions are currently recorded in, in the periodic VAT returns. Um, another point to note, I suppose, is that traders should, if, if traders are looking to avail of this uh, postponed accounting, um, traders should notify their, their customs agent and um, ensure that they, the correct code goes on the declaration to ensure that the postponed accounting is availed of. Um, and another further point in terms of goods moving from Great Britain into Ireland, um, strictly speaking, a UK trader who is not established in the Republic of Ireland is required to have an EU indirect customs, customs agent representation. So the agent basically is a jointly, severally, uh, jointly liable sorry, for any, any potential deaths incurred on the import declaration, which um, I suppose could be uh, another cost to um, doing business or importing goods into Ireland when, when looking to avail of these agents. Um, that's it for, from my side. Um, I'll now pass you over to my colleague Lee Squires, who will detail various formalities and reporting requirements around importing goods into GB. Thank you, Lorcan, and um, good morning, everyone. So I'm going to, as Lorcan said, cover the UK veteran trust and for Irish businesses trading with Great Britain, by which we mean for these purposes, the rest of the UK other than Northern Ireland, so, so England, Scotland and Wales. Um, I'll then go on to consider some special considerations for trade between GB and Northern Ireland, which will, um, which, which will impact um, Irish businesses as well, trading through Northern Ireland. So, so, so first of all, let's look at what happens when uh, an EU business wants to send goods to Great Britain. So as, as Lorcan said, those will now be imports um, subject to customs controls and formalities. So the, the first question is, who will act as the importer into Great Britain? Is, is that going to be the, the seller or the, or the buyer? So that will often be determined by the commercial INCO terms agreed between the parties. So if you agree to contract on DDP terms, delivery duty paid, 
And normally that means the seller acts as the importer into Great Britain, whereas for all other income terms, it's the, the customer that's responsible for importing. So if, if you agree then to, to contract on DDP terms, then what you're saying is that you'll take responsibility for clearing the goods through customs, and pay, dealing with any customs import declarations and paying any duties. And in order to do that, you will need um, uh, an IORI number. You'll also need a customs agent willing to act on an indirect representation basis, as, as Lorcan said, if you're not established in the UK, which means that they're jointly and severally liable. Um, you'll also need a UK VAT registration, both to recover the, the import VAT that's due when you import the goods, and then to charge VAT on, on what will then be a domestic supply to your customer in the, U, in the UK. Next slide, please. But luckily, the UK has, has deferred its import controls um, to, to facilitate trade in the, in the immediate post-Brexit period. So what that means is that from, for, throughout 2021, you don't actually have to submit an import declaration when the goods are imported from the EU in the case of so-called standard goods. Um, controlled goods are a little bit different and those are ones that are subject to restrictions or licensing requirements or excise goods. So for standard goods, you can simply make a declaration in your own records and then submit a supplementary declaration and pay any duties to HMRC up to 175 days later, so almost six months. Um, in order, if you want to use that option, then you have to have authorization to use simplified procedures and a duty to deferment account in place by the date that supplementary declaration is due, and or your agent has to have those in place. And from the 1st of January 2022, full import controls will apply, however, so you should be ready now um, to be, so if you've been importing goods since January, then it may well be that your supplementary declarations are due in, in you have supplementary declarations due in July, for example. Um, but duties don't apply if the goods have have EU origin. So let's just explore what that, what that means. And I should also say that to, in, to submit the declarations, you'll need to know things, you, you'll need to know every all of the information needed to complete a customs declaration, which you'll need to give to your agent. And those include the, the 10 digit commodity code for the products and their customs value. Next slide, please. So I, I, it's worth here considering um, briefly what is meant by origin, as there are some misconceptions. So only goods, so if goods are moving from the EU into the UK, they only benefit from zero tariffs and quotas if they are of EU origin. So the rules for now origin is sort of the economic nationality of the goods and not simply where they're shipped from. The rules for determining origin are complex and they can vary depending on the tariff heading of the product. And, and different so-called product specific rules apply. So for example, in some cases, it, whether the goods can have EU origin can depend on whether there was significant processing in the EU that changed the tariff subheading, or whether the value of the non-originating materials incorporated into the product exceed a certain percentage. Now, the, the, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement does provide for so-called bilateral accumulation, which means that you can take account UK origin goods and determine whether goods are of EU origin. However, in order for that to apply, you do need some, sim some processing that's more than simple processing in the EU. So if goods are simply moving through the UK and then going into Europe, that, so let's, let's take an example of goods starting in the Republic of Ireland, moving through the UK with no processing in the UK and then being re-imported into the EU, let's say in France, then those goods won't have UK origin. Um, and so while they have EU origin, they won't have EU preferential origin. And so tariffs will be due when those Irish goods are re-imported into the EU. There's also an issue with non-EU goods, let's say being imported into the UK and then moved into the EU. And there you may have two charges to tariffs. You may have the, the UK charge when, let's say Chinese goods move into the UK, they may then be subject to a UK tariff and then a, and then a separate EU tariff when they move into Ireland. Now there are a number of special custom special procedures that can help here that can mitigate those tariff burdens. I won't go into detail on those today in the interest of time, but they, 
But if, if you think you could have an issue with origin or you're moving goods through the UK to reach um, the EU, then um, it's worth thinking about whether any of those could apply. Next slide, please. So just just look at the VAT position if you're if you're trading with Great Britain. So in the same way as Ireland, the VAT has moved to postponed import VAT accounting. So that means that rather than being paid at the border, you can account for this on the importer's VAT return if you're VAT registered in the UK. So that eliminates the cash flow cost. If you're an e-commerce business selling to consumers, then the distance selling rules no longer apply. Under those rules before Brexit, you would charge Irish VAT and then charge UK VAT to your customer once your sales exceeded a, th a certain threshold. Now you follow the rules for imports. So, so broadly, unless you act as the importer, then the customer will need to pay any VAT and duty. There are, however, rules for low value packages, not exceeding £135 in value. And there the supplier must register for and charge UK VAT at the point of sale. And if you're selling through an online marketplace, then the marketplace like Amazon or eBay, then the marketplace will account, must account for the VAT in those cases. Next slide, please. So looking particularly at the position of, of, of Northern Ireland, um, so under the Northern Ireland Protocol, um, this still applies despite the trade and cooperation agreement. So Northern Ireland stays in the single market for goods. So there's a harmonization on good standards and no regulatory checks on goods moving between North and South. So the frictionless border is maintained. But I suppose the quid pro quo for that is that there is a, a customs and regulatory border down the Irish Sea with some regulatory checks for goods moving from GB to NI. So Northern Ireland is technically part of the UK customs territory, but imposes EU customs duties and follows EU customs rules in some cases. Northern Ireland also follows EU VAT rules in relation to goods, but perhaps confusingly not in relation to services. So. Lorcan has already explained the position of trading between North and South. This is effectively the same as if Northern Ireland had re remained part of the EU with no customs formalities and, and VAT, treatment, the VAT treatment remaining the same. But I, let's turn now to look at what happens when goods are moved from GB to Northern Ireland, which may be, next slide please, which may be relevant to your business. If you, if, if you receive goods from Northern Ireland that have moved from GB. So broadly, there's a customs border now down the Irish Sea. So when goods move into Northern Ireland from Great Britain, customs declarations are required in the same way as any other goods moving into the EU. And you'll need an XI Iori number if you're acting as the importer into Northern Ireland. The UK has set up a what's known as the Trader Support Service, which is effectively a free customs agent to support those customs declarations. Different rules apply for postal packages where there's a temporary regime until the 30th of September, but I, I won't go into detail on that today. But the, the, the real significant issue is that tariffs are potentially payable if the goods are deemed to be at risk of onward movement into the EU. The EU tariff is payable and broadly all goods are at risk unless they come within one of a, a number of exemptions. Um, if we could next slide, please. So. I've set out briefly here where what those, except, though, 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 those exceptions are. So one is if the goods are of UK origin under the rules of the TCA, then you can claim a zero tariff. There are issues there, particularly with EU and third country goods moving through the, the UK into Northern Ireland, as we discussed before. You can be authorised under the UK trader scheme and declare your goods not at risk, and we'll come to look at that in a bit more detail. And there's also a waiver scheme that you can claim a waiver of the duty up to a maximum of 200,000 euros over a three year period assessed on a rolling basis, which will help some smaller traders. Otherwise, you need to look at a custom special procedure or relief that may assist. This is beyond the scope of today's talk, but it may help manufacturers or distributors. Next slide, please. Just to if you could just move on and add the boxes there. So just to briefly explain what the trader scheme means, if you're authorised and you have evidence that the goods are only for sale to your final use by end consumers in the UK, such as by, by for sale in a retail store, then you can declare them not at risk. There must be no commercial processing in Northern Ireland unless you're within some narrow exceptions. So the, the, the impact of this is that for most 
manufacturers and distributors have significant issues unless they can claim a zero tariff under the trade and cooperation agreement or a waiver because they're processing or they're distributing if they are to the Republic of Ireland then they can't make those declarations next slide please and that this will also that those rules also apply to goods moving through Northern Ireland and onto the Republic of Ireland I'm just I'm conscious we're we're over time so I'm just going to briefly run through the um, the, the, the VAT position. So you continue to charge VAT on trade between North, between GB and Northern Ireland, subject to some exceptions and special cases. Where goods are moving from GB through Northern Ireland into the Republic of Ireland, there is some extra complexity. The HMRC approach there is that you have to charge UK VAT, which could result in the Irish customer bearing UK VAT and having to have a UK VAT registration or make a special claim under the um, EU VAT cross-border refund scheme. You can structure around that if you treat it as two different movements of goods or you can use a relief, but that's something that's a bit more complex and may need some special advice. And finally, if you're, if you're in the Republic of Ireland sending goods through Northern Ireland to GB, then you're required to charge a UK VAT to your customer. Next slide, please. From a, from a customs perspective, goods moving from Northern Ireland to GB, there's not normally a UK export declaration required, although there may be an Irish export declaration required if you're doing an indirect export, moving goods from Ireland through Northern Ireland to GB. Now, Northern Ireland qualifying goods have unfettered access to the UK market with no declarations, tariffs or customs checks. And at the moment, there's a very wide definition of qualifying goods. So any goods not under customs supervision or control in Northern Ireland. So that would include Irish goods that move into the north and across to GB. So there is kind of a back door into the GB market through Northern Ireland. However, there is an anti-avoidance provision which provides that where goods are moved through Northern Ireland, and the main purpose or one of the main purposes of that movement is to avoid UK tariffs or import processes, then, then customs obligations do apply. I should also say that the definition is going to be updated later this year, so it's only available to Northern Ireland established businesses which may close that back door to some extent. Um, next slide, please. So I, th I think that's all I was going to say. I'm conscious we've, we've run over. I'll just hand back to Lorcan, who may just briefly run through what businesses should, should do now and the, and the financial support. Thanks, Lee. Um, I think in the interest of time, again, um, rather than running through the last two slides, um, the slides will be made available to uh, participants. Um, yeah. But it'd be, it's a useful reference point, I suppose, just in terms of action points and how to address um, Brexit issue. So um, that slide will cover off just general uh, um, Brexit related matters. And the next slide, sorry, is, um, is tailored towards uh, businesses trading in and with Northern Ireland, which Lee covered off there, which you can appreciate has another layer of complexity. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, and just to wrap up then, uh, finally, in terms of financial support, um, inter-trade, Ireland offers vouchers up to 2,000 sterling or 2,250 euro inclusive of that towards professional advice in relation to breaks and matters. So it's important that that um, facility is there to be availed of and there's a, the qualifying criteria is, um, is listed there on that slide. Um, next slide, please. And that's the, the final slide has the link to, to where you can actually apply for the voucher. Um, but that's, um, that, that's, that's it yeah. from the Brexit slides. Um, I'll hand you back to Una. Thanks very much, Lorcan and Lee. Um, to be fair, that's quite a comprehensive um, presentation that you've given. And also in the time frame, I'm assuming you could talk for weeks on Brexit, VAT, costumes. Um, and just listening to you, I was, um, thinking that this is a minefield and that it is quite complex and I'm, I'm, I for one am glad that both you Lorcan and Lee are there to advise us. Um, guys there's no questions have come through the question and answer section and I do appreciate it's now 10 past 11 and we promised we'd have you gone by 11. I do want to say though that the slides will be shared with you afterwards. The recording will be on the website. And if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us either individually or you can reach out to me and I'll pass the query on 
to the to the subject matter expert um, being the guys who are on the call today. So on that note, I just want to say thank you very much for attending the conference today and we look forward to seeing you at our next one, which will be in June. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.